got a full battery today, and I haven't preached in two weeks. It might be a little while, right? <laughs> Proverbs 22, 6. I'll read this in a moment. We're going to finish our series today, Family Matters. And I've been honored to, um, to share this series with you. And I hope that uh, you've, you've grown in your faith and in your family. As, as we've studied about um, these subjects together, that family matters uh, greatly to God. You know, God instituted the family. Uh, he, he created it. Um, his hand, that means that his patent, uh, his, his authority is over the family and to be over the family. And as I said from the very beginning, one and a half months ago when we began this series, God gave you your family. It's a gift. He gave you your family. He places high value on the home. And if we want to see a strong foundation in this church and within our government, within our schools, in our society, in our nation, then that commitment has to be so strong and it begins within us unto Him. With our commitment to Christ, with our commitment to serve the Lord, with our commitment to honor the Lord and walk with the Lord within our homes, it has to begin within me and within you first. So here's the thing. We can't come here expecting God to bless our families, to, to grow our families, to, to grow our faith, if He's nowhere to be found in our homes. Right. We, won't, we won't make it. That's why we studied from the beginning. That's why devoted mothers matter. That, that's why covenant marriages matter. That's why obedient children matter. That's why involved parents matter. That's why, that's why we work out those dysfunctional situations and moments within our homes. That's why you stay together no matter what. That's why godly fathers are so vital to the home. Because God desires for your family to thrive. And the only way that's going to happen is if we as the people of God commit our homes to His guidance, to His authority, to His word, and accept no substitutes. And I want to finish this series today by giving you an all-important statement. This is the title for the message, Christ Following Families Matter. Christ Following Families Matter. Before we study this text this morning, I want to ask you all families today, whether you're a young family or older family, in-between family, a new family, um, I, want to, I want to ask you this all-important question. If you had a target before you, a target before a goal that you were trying to hit and, and establish for your family, what would that goal be for your home? If you had a target, a goal for your home, what would it be? Is it a clear target? As I ask you that question, do you know what it is? Do you know what the purpose for your family is? And here's the thing. It's been said, it's been said over and over again. If you aim at nothing, you hit it every single time. All right, and so let's be honest today from family to family. How many of you know the goal for your home? You know the target for your home to hit. How many of you know it? And if you do, how are you going to accomplish that goal? You know, you, you never travel a road without it leading to somewhere. All right, a, a destination, a goal has to be in mind. And the problem with so many of our, of our families today, and mine is not exempt from this sin either, the problem is that we are too, too good with, with the convenience, the status quo. We're, we're too easy to go with what we can settle for. We'll often settle for good when God wants best for our home. And so this is what we do. We set the standard way too low in our families. And, and, and so we, we think that we can just make it and survive by being content with just opening up our Bibles a couple of times a week, by showing up here once a week, or maybe if, if you're really devoted twice a week, uh, war, warming a pew, going to class, and, and, just, and we think we think that that is going to make us thrive as families by just living off of what we have here. And, and, and we get by with this mundane relationship with Jesus Christ. And then the next thing that happens is if we live with a mundane relationship with Jesus, we'll grab the next thing that will take our interest. We'll settle for what we think is, is better. And the, and the things that we, we value, the thing, and the way that we live, and the things that we do, the people that we become are everything but what God wants us to be. I'm telling you today, and you can take it for what it's worth. You can look into God's Word with me if you want. If becoming like Jesus Christ is not your target, if, you're, if, you're, if looking more like Him and your daily walk in life is not your target, 
if your family, being faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, is not your target, then you're selling yourselves way too short. And you're minimizing the power of the gospel within your home. The target cannot be soccer, ballet, basketball, gymnastics, piano, extracurricular school activities, super lengthy vacations, and work on top of work and some more work. And then if you've got time, Jesus fits in the schedule. It's not going to work that way. Right? It doesn't, it, it, there's not enough room, folks, for Jesus and. There's not enough room. He's a jealous God. He wants, he wants all the focus. It's his, Jesus must be the target. And you look at society's picture today of the family, and the church is nowhere to be found, right? Uh, uh, in the business of life, the gospel is always second tier versus everything else in the world. A relationship with Jesus and worship time with him never wins uh, against social development, prestigious education, athletic training, or more opportunities for being successful financially. This world promotes self, right? right. It, it promotes self, and it's just another way that the enemy has sleekly uh, and deceitfully put his way into our lives, and he's trying to destroy what God is trying to do within your homes. There's way too much of the world influencing God's people. All right, and, and I'm not, listen, I'm not legalist, legalistic by no means. Can you say the word? See, it's not. <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not a super religious fanatic. I'm not obsessed with church attendance. I'm not obsessed with numbers or, or success. I love my family. We too like to have fun. We too like to go on vacations. We want Micah to have a good time as he grows up in life. We want our children to have a good life. We want, we want our family to succeed. We want our family to do well. We believe in hard work. We believe in earning accomplishments. And we want our children to do something that they love. But above all else, my wife and I want our son to know Jesus Christ. Amen. And we want him to live for Jesus. Christ, and we want him to do what Jesus Christ has called him to do first. That's, That's the purpose of our family. All right, and, and so, so put it this way if Christ isn't the target, you're going to run into a dead end street after dead end street after dead end street. And what breaks me week in and out, I look across this church and we look across our community, see so many great families that have all the potential in the world to, to make something for Jesus Christ, to be much for Jesus Christ, to be great for the cause of Jesus Christ. And what happens is so many of us are guilty of this. We pursue everything else but Jesus. And we teach everything else to our children but Jesus. And we wonder why we fail. We wonder why we don't succeed. We wonder why we're so hungry. What does God want for my family, the target has to be Christ. As Chip Ingram wrote, the goal has nothing to do with hairstyles and sandals. It's not, stumping, it's not stuffing a bunch of Bible verses in their heads, conforming to a certain denomination or mandate that they have a quiet time. Our task is higher and much more ambitious than that. The point is for your family to be kind like Jesus, to be disciplined like Jesus, to be other-centered like Jesus, to be holy and pure, not because they have to, but because they love Jesus and want to be like Him. Folks, your children may never go to Harvard, all right? Uh, or they may. Um, they, they may have a lot of letters after their name, or they may not. Your children and grandchildren may never be good at sports. They may be good at sports. They may never be good at ballet, or they may be good at it. God may have designed them to keep up the family business, or he may call them into the mission field. Who, who knows or, or into something that you know nothing about? But I want you to hear and understand and apply this word today. And children, your parents may not have super jobs, or they may not have the education, or they may not have given you a whole lot of gifts or spoiled you rotten, but if you have parents that love Jesus, and they love you, and are training you in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, you couldn't ask for a better home. Amen. And so I want, I want to take the remaining few moments that we have and see how we can be Christ-following families. Proverbs 22.6 gives us the answer. Let's read that together. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? Proverbs 22, 6. You know this passage, too. Actually, of all, the, of all the, the verses in Proverbs, this is probably one that you know best. Train up a child in the way he should go. Not the ways, but say in the way. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, 
He will not depart from it. Lord, would you bless the word of God today? Would you bless our hearts as we study? Would you teach us, Lord, what it looks like? Model before us in your word. Help us to see in this passage what it looks like to be a Christ-following family. That should be the target, the desire of our hearts as we study from family to family. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I want to give you today um, uh, some points, a few keys on how to be a Christ-following family. I want you to remember, okay, as, as families, you're always teaching and communicating something to each other. Right, you're always doing that. You're never, you're never off the job. You, do, you know, do you know how the Word of God, back, back in Bible times, you know how the Word of God has survived the course of time? You know how it survived the, the course of history? You know how Christianity has, has spread like, like wildfire all over the world? You know how disciples have been made and made and made and used greatly for the kingdom of God and, and for God's glory over the generations? Let's state the obvious. The work of the Lord has been done, okay? We know that. The Holy Spirit has moved and Jesus Christ is still saving souls. But here's the thing. Families have committed to follow Christ over the generations. And they taught that to their children. And those children have taught it to their children and their children. From gener generation to generation, families all over the world have learned the Word of God and they sought to live out the Word of God with their lives. The family has done that through God's grace, through God's power, through God's provision. All the glory belongs to the Lord, but, but the family over the generations have faithfully followed Jesus. And that's how you're a christ following family. As a result, you hear about these movements all over the world. And that's what Solomon's doing here in Proverbs. He's writing uh, to, to his children. And he really, uh, he wants everyone to understand the very important truths from the perspective of the Lord so that they would gain wisdom. So that they, so that they would, would learn the word of the Lord. So that they would gain wisdom through fearing him. And in truth, they would gain knowledge and in knowledge, power and understanding and discretion and discernment and obedience. These things were taught to these children, and they taught them to their children. From generation to generation, the Word of God was central. The truth of God's Word is what builds the foundation of your home. It's, what, it's what's built mine. And, and, and the only way that we're going to have a firm foundation in this church and in your life is for every family to apply and live out the truth of God's Word every single moment of every single day. But it takes every single member of your family committing to Christ. All right? Or there's going to be cracks in the foundation. All right? In this verse today, there are several things that we can learn that will help us to maintain and pass on this biblical foundation for Christ following families. And this is how we do it. The Scripture says, train up a child. In the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Before I give you these few things, I want you to know, and this is for the entire family. This is a question that I want you to answer. Are you willing to do what it takes to be a Christ-following family? Serious question. And this is from family to family. Are you willing to do what it takes to be a Christ-following family? Here's how it works. Christ-following homes understand the importance of following Him. Christ-following families understand the importance of following Him. Look at the very first part of verse 6. Train up a child. Train up a child. The phrase train up is not a suggestion. Okay, when, when Solomon wrote this, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Raise up your family in God. Raise up your family in Christ, in the Lord. This is a well-known verse, right? Did everybody know this verse when we read it today? Train up a child in the way that he's got. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I'm sure everybody's read this time and time again. But there's several ways that you can look at the word train up or, or raise up. And this are, there's some things I want you to get about this, these two words, train up. It's important. The, 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 understand the importance of following him. It's important because it reflects our desire to follow Jesus Christ. It's important to raise your family in Christ. It's important to be Christ following in your home because it reflects your desire to follow Jesus Christ. It's all in your want to. It's all in your want to. All right, I spent some time recently with a the, with the gentleman who keeps spinning his wheels in life. Okay, and physically, spiritually, he seems to rise up. 
He does great. He's off and running. He does well, and then he fails. Big, big time. And then he gets a little better, and then he fails again. It seems to be the same pattern. And if he's not careful, he'll waste his entire life trying to get it when he's already got it. Okay? And, and it came down to it. We were talking. And, and God spoke to me to speak to him, and God spoke to me through speaking to him about what I should do too. All right, so, so, he, so he preached to both of us. And I said to my friend, my brother in Christ, whom I love, I said, you can win. You can live a holy life. You can make something of yourself if you will desire to be different. Mm -hmm. If you'll desire to be different. That's good. If, if you want it. If you'll desire to serve and follow Jesus Christ, your life will be drastically different. Change forever. The moment you stop desiring, folks, within your homes, the moment that I stop desiring within my home, and the moment I stop caring, the moment that I stop believing that God can do a great work is the moment that we fail. When you stop desiring, when you lose the desire in your home to lead them in the way of Jesus Christ, you fail. All right, every single time. Isn't, isn't that the same thing with, with us and our walks with Christ? If we truly desire to follow Christ, if we truly desire to, to love Him and to serve Him, if we desire to worship Him with our lives and grow in Him and live according to His Word, if we desire, we succeed, don't we? A hundred percent of the time. If we desire it, we succeed. But the moment we stop caring, the moment that we start slouching and start neglecting our relationship with God is when we start failing as a whole. All right. Families, this is, this is what it takes. Desire. Desire. It's important. It's important. Understand its importance. There's not a disciple in the Word of God who ever followed Jesus who did not desire to worship Him. They wouldn't follow Him if they didn't desire to have a relationship with Him. They wouldn't follow Him if they didn't desire to be close to Him, if they didn't want to do things His way. If they didn't want to do things Jesus' way, they failed, they were gone, they're not mentioned here anymore, or they're mentioned that they failed, and they're never mentioned again. All right? There's not a disciple in the Word of God who ever followed Jesus who did not desire Him. It's about desire. And this is the problem with our families. We think that if we just go through the motions and we, we just attend class or we raise our kids in a Christian environment, we take them to Chick-fil-A and listen to the music as we eat. I love Chick-fil-A. Right? Or, or uh, if, if we send them off to camp, or to a Christian school, or make sure that they have Christian friends, we think that that's going to suffice. And everything's going to be okay. But here's the thing. Those things are fine and dandy. I'm all for them. But if your child doesn't have a desire to grow in Jesus Christ, they won't. Amen. If you don't desire for your home to grow in Jesus Christ, it's not going to grow. You're not going to succeed. If you as a parent do not desire for your family to follow Christ and you're not pushing that desire like a drill sergeant, you're not pushing them to grow in Christ, doing something with that desire, I don't care how many times you show up or how many singings you go to or how many messages you hear or books you read about parenting, if you don't desire to follow Jesus Christ, your family will fail Amen. every time. Where do we go wrong? We forfeit our desire. To follow Jesus Christ. We quench our thirst for the things of God. And we replace them the things that we want. And then we fail. And the harsh truth is this. If we fail to desire Christ, you starve, I starve. If we fail to follow Christ, if we fail to desire Him, we perish spiritually. And so will your family. So, so what's it going to be? You see the importance of, of following Christ with your desire? You know what train up means here? It means to create a thirst within your home. That's what it means. Train up means to create a thirst. The Hebrew word that's used here is the actions of a midwife who would, use, uh, who would take her finger and she would dip it into something sweet. And what she would do is she would rub it in the top of her baby's mouth. All right? and, and she'd rub the roof of their mouth so that the child would want to be nursed. And fed. That's the only way that they could get them used to that. So they put their finger in something sweet, put it on the roof of their mouth, and they and they they just trained them up so that they would desire the milk. The midwife wanted to encourage thirst, the desire for her child to eat, so that they would live. Now we got to make a great Jesus application here, okay? In this passage, Proverbs twenty two six. Families, we're encouraged in this passage to stimulate and train up within each other uh, a Christ. Following godliness, we're, 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 we're trained up to create a hunger in each other for righteousness and wise living. And of course, this word is speaking to parents, all right? But we're going to apply it to the whole body of Christ here today. 
You want your families to thrive. You want them to follow after Jesus Christ. We've got to stimulate the thirst. Stimulate the thirst. So that they'll desire to follow Jesus. That's the goal in this church. That's why we preach the word of God. That's why you go to Sunday school. That's why we go on mission trips. That's why we have youth group. That's why we have children's group. We do all of these things so that you'll have a stimulated thirst, a desire to follow after Jesus Christ wholeheartedly so that you'll have an appetite for the things of God. How many of you, honestly, came hungry to church this morning? How many of you came hungry this morning? That's sad. <laughs> I'm talking about spiritually hungry. How many of you came to be filled up with the Spirit of God? How many of you came to worship the living God? How many of you came to get a word from God? It's the same in your life. It's the same in your family's life. We're to build one another up in Christ, in godliness, in His Word, so that we will further desire Him. The thirst has got to be there. You've got to want it. But that desire to follow Him, it has to be yours. Challenge your parents tonight. Kids, challenge your parents. Ask them if they're thirsty. To follow Christ. Parents, ask your kids tonight before they go to bed. Are you hungry to follow God? Are you hungry to serve God? Okay, do others, do others see that you desire to follow Christ? Your desire could encourage their desire, but it has to be their own. I want you to imagine going out to eat with a group of friends, but you're not that hungry. Y'all ever done that before? Everybody says, let's go out the Outback. But you're not that hungry. That's not possible, is it? But you, <laughs> but you go out to eat, and everybody around you order steaks and burgers, and they order those onion rings and milkshakes. Woo. <laughs> and so everybody around you orders, but you're not hungry. They bring out the food. It arrives, and it smells so good. What do you do? You say, hey, do you mind if I have one of those onion rings? <laughs> do you mind if I have one of those fries? Do you mind if I have a sip of your shake? <laughs> okay, and, and they might give it to you. They might not. But what happens here? Their food came, you smelled it, you tasted it, and then you wanted your own. Within our families, if we want to follow Christ and model Christ, then we must desire Christ. We've got to want it in our lives. When you rise up, when you lay down, when you live out your life each day, following Jesus is everything you do, is everything important, okay? It's not just that it's important because it reflects our desire to follow Him. It's also important because it reflects our dedication in following Him. Not just our desire but also our dedication. How many of y'all would, would say today, I'm a dedicated person? Just raise your hand. I'm a dedicated person. It's all right. There's nothing prideful about that. That's, that's a characteristic of it. I'm a dedicated person. All right? Now, now, I really like this part because the word for train can also mean to dedicate. It can mean to dedicate, to give something or someone up to the Lord. Now, parents, want to ask you this, and you answer this question within your hearts. Have you genuinely dedicated your family to Christ? As parents, have you genuinely dedicated your family to Christ? Do they belong to Him? Have you placed them on the altar of praise unto God? And have you said to Him and committed to Him your spouse, your children, your life, and said, Lord, my family is yours? They're yours for your glory, for your power, for your honor, for your service. For your worship. When I think of dedication to the Lord, I immediately think of sacrifice. I think of an altar. I think of the temple. I think of, I think of the place where God met with his people for so many generations. And the temple, it was the highest and, and holiest place on earth. And it was a place where the people of God met with God every single moment of it. Every day they met with God faithfully. It was where he was worshipped. It was where they found forgiveness. It was where they found cleansing. It's where they, they got an assignment, instruction. It was the place where everything was laid before the altar of God in, in service and in worship so that they could have fellowship with him. Shouldn't our families model the same dedication? Like your family is a gift, an offering to God. Your family is the holy of holies of God. And every day you're bringing it up to the Lord. You're sacrificing it to Him. Shouldn't our homes be a place that models holiness like the temple was? You know, should, shouldn't our homes be a temple of the Lord? Shouldn't our lives reflect such dedication unto God that everything that we bring into our homes, whether it be by word or by action or, or by thought, should be a pleasing sacrifice unto Him? God's calling our families to make our homes the holy of holies. 
to make our families living sacrifices on the altar of God every single day to dedicate ourselves to following Christ. Dedicate your home. That's the challenge today. Dedicate your home as a temple unto the Lord. But just like it was with desire, okay, just like it was with the desire, you have to desire dedication too. You choose to dedicate your life to Christ. You choose to give your home to the Lord. You choose to be dedicated to His Word. You choose to live a life that gives Him lots of glory. You choose whether or not you're going to be committed to Christ in everything that you do. You choose whether or not you're going to dedicate your home into the altar of God. But understand that the call of Christ is for you to follow Him with every single thing, with everything, with everything that you are. That means I follow Christ with dedication every place I go. That means I dedicate my life to the Lord with everyone I come in contact with. That means that I dedicate, in Christ, uh, every, I dedicate to Christ what I listen to and what I watch and, and who I'm with and how I present myself to the world. You reflect dedication all the time. Right. Who are you dedicated to? You, you reflect it all the time. Are you, are you dedicated to Christ? It's the first step in following Jesus. You know, tonight we're going to get to baptize some new believers in Christ. One who rededicated their life to the Lord. That was the first thing they had to decide was whether or not they were going to dedicate their heart to Christ and live for Christ. It's the first thing for your family, too. You've got to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I want my family to be yours. I want to dedicate my, that's my desire. That's my drive. That's my, that's my desire and dedication is to give my home to Christ. Here's the second thing. Not only does the family understand the importance of following Jesus, they also value the instruction. That is given to us so that we may follow Jesus. I'll make this point so simple to you all. All the instruction that you'll ever need for life in Christ is in your hands right now. You get that? All the instruction that you're ever going to need in following Jesus Christ with your home lies in your hands right now. Okay, it's the very word of God. Train up a child. What does it say? In the way. Everybody say, in the way. Train up a child in the way. I want to ask you, what is the way? <laughs> what is the way? There's only one right answer, okay? And it's not your way. It's not my way. All right, it's not, it's not your method. It's not your training or your wisdom. It's not, ju- it's not your teaching or your insights on how to raise your family your way. The only way to raise a family in the Lord is to raise them, instruct them, and guide them in the Word of God. That's it. it. It's God's way. All right? It's not Burger King. You can't have it your way. All right? So, so I must be hungry. I keep missing all these restaurants. <laughs> now, God's way in word isn't the most popular way. All right? I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there. God's way isn't the most popular way, nor is it the easiest way. That's right. It's the best way, though. Uh-huh. All right? It's the, it's the only way to instruct your family and lead your family in following Jesus. So here's the challenge. Get in the word. Train up a child in the way. That means you've got to be in the way. You've got to be going in the way. How do I get in the way? Get in the Word. Value the Word of the Lord in your home, for it's the only way you're going to grow in Christ because it's the only way you can truly know what He has to say to you and your family. It's the only way. His Word is truth. His Word is alive. His Word is like oxygen for your lungs. His word, his word is like food for your body. It's like medicine for your sick and weary soul. It's invaluable. It's irreplaceable. It's unchangeable. Eternal truth. Train up your child. Train up your home in the way. Value the instruction of the word of the Lord. God's word, his instructions, his commands are the way. And we cheat our families. We starve our families, if we fail to give time together to God's Word. I'll tell you this, and this is the conviction in my heart, my desire for my own home. I don't want my wife and my son to see me feeding everybody else but them. And it's easy to do, right? I don't want my wife and children to start spiritually at home or go looking somewhere else for spiritual nourishment when it's my responsibility to lead and instruct my family in the Word of God. Don't let anybody else take that from you, dads. Moms, 
Don't let anybody else take that responsibility from you. God's word has to be instructed in your home all the time or what we do here is in vain. You get it? And what that's the truth because I've experienced it before as a child, okay? And also as a husband and father. Now, if we could all be honest, you have too. It doesn't have to go that way, though. You can commit right now to following Christ by getting in his word, hearing his word, following his commands through your life. How else are you going to know about Jesus Christ? How else? How else are your children going to know how to follow Jesus? How else is, how else is your family going to stand strong in a sin-infested world where the enemy has implanted so many traps and, and bombs and evil schemes and attacks? We must value God's word. We must value his instruction, and he'll reward you for it. He'll enrich your family. He'll bless your family. I read an interesting story about an old miner. He lived the life of a hermit deep in the mountains of Colorado. And when he died, some of his distant relatives came back to collect his valuables. They arrived to the miner's shack. They, be they began to collect his possessions, which included old pots, mining equipment, some pretty worn furniture, some tattered clothes. They quickly cleaned the house out, and they got ready to load the truck up when one of the man's oldest friends comes by, and he says, do you mind if I have what's left in that old shack? In the most country Colorado voice I tried, do you mind if I have what's in that shack? <laughs> all right? And, and the family said, no, no, take it all. Take it all. We, we've got all the valuable stuff. We'll go on our way. You can have whatever's in there. And the man thanked the woman. He goes into this old shack. He walks over to the friend's shack. He goes in, looks around a bit. Then he reaches under one of the old crickety tables that they didn't want on their truck. He pulls up a floorboard. And little by little, he lifts out all this gold miner's gold. <laughs> Millions and millions of dollars worth in this man's home, and the family never saw it. Apparently, the old miner died with only his true friend knowing his actual worth. It's the same way. Our Lord, our Savior, our friend, Jesus Christ, wants to make himself known to us, but we can become like distant relatives to him. All right, if, if only we could get to know him better, would we find that he has riches for us as well? What are his riches? They can only be found in the word of God. That's, right. That's it. Okay, his word, his word is perfect. His word transforms it. His word revives and restores. His word gives us wisdom and instructs us on what is right and wise and true. It's in his word that we not only find what makes us holy, we also find what will make us truly happy and content in Jesus Christ. Families, value the instruction of God's word. Train up one another in the way of his word. You say, we've already heard this. I've already heard this a million times. It's supposed to be in the word of God. What else is there to learn, folks? What else is there to learn? If you don't read and study or do God's word within your homes, you won't follow Jesus closely. Here's the last thing today. The family must keep in mind the impressions that are made of their decision to follow Christ or not. The impressions. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's the fact, okay? You and I make an impression on someone every single day. You make an impression whether you try to or not. All right, three important questions to ponder. What impression are you making on the world? What impression are you making on the world? Do they see Jesus Christ? Do they see you following Jesus Christ? Here's the second question. What impression are you making on the church? Do they see you as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ? And the most important question is this. What impression are you making on your family? Do they see you striving to follow Jesus Christ? This verse tells us plainly that if we train up a child or our family in the way that he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. Many people make the mistake of looking at this verse as a promise. But a proverb isn't a promise. All right? A proverb is a wise saying that has proven true over time. Okay, A proverb is a general truth that usually is true, but you know as well as I do that things don't always go as planned in our family, do they? All right? Because you say, well, I've trained up my child. He doesn't walk with God. She doesn't walk with God. I've tried to train my home up in the Lord, but my wife or my husband, they're, they're not following after the Lord. Children sometimes go astray from godliness, right, parents? 
And sometimes parents stray away from godliness too. Parents even stray from him as well. But the truth is here in the text. If we'll all commit ourselves to following the Lord and stay in his word and commit ourselves to his way, we will not depart from what we have been taught. It will be instilled within our hearts and our lives in Christ. What we believe, the example that we bring forth, how we live will stick. But we've got to want it. But as we were reminded this earth, it has to be our desire. We have to make that commitment to make that kind of impression. We're all making an impression that says train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right now, you're making an impression on someone in this room. All right, and, and it's as simple as this. Am I doing, as a family, first, am I doing what Jesus has commanded and called for me to do in my life? Is my family dedicated to Christ? Is my family valuing the instruction of the Lord? Is my family desiring to follow Him? Is my family making the impression that I follow Jesus Christ faithfully? Within your hearts, to be honest, within your hearts, you know. You know if your family is a family that has a heart for God. You know that. The impression you make today will impact the impression you make tomorrow. Now, what impression are you making? Are you following Christ in your family, in your home, in your example, in your faith? Christ following family matter. Amen? It matter. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart. Will you stand? Ms. Tammy, you could just play today if you're in touch. I want you, kids, if you'll do this, I want you to find your families, okay? And if you don't have a family member with you, I want you to find a family that you consider to be fam like family. You go find your families. Go ahead. Go find them. Find your families. families, this invitation time is going to be real simple, okay? I want you, to, to, amongst one another, I want you to decide today if you're going to be a family that follows Jesus Christ. All right, that means there's going to be some serious soul searching to do within your homes. That means some, some parents may have to do some witnessing today, <laughs> all right? Because you know whether or not your children belong to Christ. Kids, you know whether or not your parents belong to Christ. There's some, some questions that have to be asked today. But I want you to decide today within your family. If you're really Christ-following families, you say, I don't know how. We just, we just spent 35 minutes talking about how. Okay? We have got to understand that it is so important to desire and dedicate our lives to the Lord. That's first, all right? So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need one. Okay? You need to give your heart to Christ. All right? And I'm sure, I'm sure, as many great families as we have today, I'm sure that your family member can tell you how to follow Jesus Christ. All right, so you need to trust in him first. The second thing it was all about the instruction of the Lord. You've got to decide as a family, am I going to be faithful to Christ by following his word, by being his word? That means there's going to be some renovations done today in the home too. If you're not studying the word of God together, I challenge you, study the word of God together. Pray together. Read the word together. Make that commitment. If I'm going to be a faithful follower of Christ within my home, I've got to be in the word. And then you've got to pray, to, pray together too. Pray together that I'll make the impression on the world that I follow Jesus Christ as a family, as an individual, as a church family. That's the invitation today. Commit your families to following Christ. You can do that. I'm going to give Tammy the opportunity just to play through a song. Okay, you pray with your families how you need to pray with them. If you need to come to the altar together, you come to the altar together. Give your family to Christ. Give them to Christ. You can do it.
Thomas and Aaron have both trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Isn't that great? Yes. Greatest news ever. They both have committed their lives to the Lord. Um, actually, we've got to talk to both of them um, about their decision to follow Christ last week at VBS. And um, they today want to come forward and, um, and, and join our church family and be baptized by, as, as, as their statement of faith that they've trusted in Christ. That's how they're going to be joining our family is by baptism. So what we need you to do is for first for you to pray for them. Pray that God will grow them up you know, in his word. Pray for their families that they will train them up as we've read today and studied today in the word of the Lord. But then also pray that our church family will be there too to help them. And as, as your pastor and your pastor, if there's anything that I can do to help you, if you need somebody to laugh at one day, just come by and I'll help you, okay? <laughs> Alright, but I do want to help you though, okay? And help you right, be trained up in the Lord too. We're here for you, alright? And we love you and we're proud of you. And all you people, will you be behind them too? This is how we're going to vote today. If you'd like Thomas and Aaron to be a part of our church family, would you just stand to your feet? Look at all these people. That's the vote today, all right? That's the vote. And we're glad that you're a part of our family, all right? Let's pray for them, and I'll pray for you too as we end the service. Amen? Amen. Lord, I want to thank you today for, uh, for Thomas Taylor. I thank you for, for Aaron Bradley. I thank you for the Bradley families and, and the Taylor families. They mean so much to us. Uh, Lord, it's incredible. This, this is a fantastic moment. Um, I know for, for you, Lord, and for our church family, because they, they're responding to their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we, the words can't contain how excited we are for them and for them following after you, for them understanding um, the power of the gospel, for them trusting in faith, in faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Thank you, Lord, for saving their souls first. Lord, thank you, God, for, for using their families to bring them to Christ. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than a mom and dad being able to pray with their child to receive the Lord. And so we rejoice in their salvation today. We rejoice, Lord, that they're going to be baptized tonight. Um, as, as an expression of that faith, of that change that has come into their life. Lord, we're grateful for that. And Father, we do pray for their families. We pray, Lord, that you would use them greatly um, to continue to train them up in the Word. Use our church family to encourage them, to love on them, and to help be a part of that training in the Lord. I know they're going to serve you well. I know, Lord, that you have great things in store for them. They're gonna, and, I, and I trust, Lord, that they'll follow you with their whole heart and life as they grow in you. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for, for the, the, the great power of your word. Um, Lord, it was, so, it was so wonderful to see families praying together, crying together, um, embracing one another. Lord, may that be the reflection of the life that we live outside of these church walls. Help us, God, to be faithful, following families of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We're thankful that you love us first. And God, be with us today. Help us to come back tonight ready to worship you like we've never worshiped before. Use us today for your kingdom and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love on these families, all right? Love on them.